I had an encounter with the Lord over this passage. It changed my life. It changed me from a person that could only see the tragedy that happens in the last days to a person that looked at what God was wanting to do in the last days for the redeeming, the transformation of cities and nations. I have lived since May of 79 for this one thing, to see cities and nations transformed by a people that walk with presence, with wisdom and power. Um, a series, I've just called it the Solomon series. It's actually a series about wisdom, its effect in the people of God, and how God can use us to bring transformation to culture, to society. I do believe it's the heart of the Lord. I believe uh, next, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll bring to you uh, the other side of the message, and that is that we need two elements, two realms to minister effectively. The first one is wisdom that I'm dealing with in this series, but the last one that we'll end with is the issue of power. It's not one or the other, it's both in tandem, and I'll, I'll try to make that a little clearer in, in a future weeks. I believe that the Lord uh, has some truths hidden in the life of Solomon, in his experiences with God, in his mandate given to him by God that are appropriate for us to see, to learn, um, so that we can actually be effective in seeing the world around us change. God loves cities. He loves cities. We weren't saved merely to himself by ourselves. Here's an interesting phrase I just heard a couple weeks ago that's really left its mark on me. The disciples belonged before they believed. I think about it. That's amazing. They belonged. They were actually a part of the 12, if you will, community before they actually believed in who Jesus was. It's stunning. They followed, they had a certain lifestyle of learning, of adapting, of being impacted, ministered to, and they came to a place of faith through that process. But they were not isolated one-on-one -on -one with Jesus in that relationship. It was a community. And it doesn't mean we don't have individual relationships with the Lord. We absolutely do. But we were saved unto something. We were saved into a family, into a community, into the body of Christ, a holy nation, if you will. And throughout Scripture, we have this concept of being joined together with other people. And so this, this idea that the Lord still loves cities is really important. The, it's a no-brainer, and yet, theologically, throughout decades and perhaps even centuries, I, I, I don't want, to, at least for the last century or so, the emphasis in the church has been on the disasters of the last days and not the victories. And so the church has become acclimated to defeat, to trial, to difficulty, and has actually taken on a spirit of the world in its expectation of what could actually happen during our lifetime. I believe it's theologically irresponsible to take the great promises of Scripture and put them off into a period of time for which we have no responsibility. When we see that nations will come to God, when we see that cities will cry out to God, when we see that entire people groups will be harvested, brought into the kingdom, we do ourselves and the people around us a great disservice when we slot that for a future time. It must be something that baits us. It must be something that hooks us, that captures the affection of our heart so that we learn to stand before the Lord and contend for that breakthrough in our lifetime. And I'll be honest, if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I at least want to create a significant enough momentum that my children step into that inheritance. And if it doesn't happen in their lifetime, then their children. The point is, there is only one direction to go, and that is for the cities and nations of the world to be brought into the kingdom of God. But it is, it, many of us who have... Uh, you know, kind of revivalist backgrounds, the, the cry for the invasion of God, the encounters of God, the, you know, trembling in his presence and all that stuff. We, we tend to think that the transformation will take place because those meetings were successful, because those encounters were successful. There's an element of truth there, but the Lord is actually raising up a company of people that live intentionally to bring transformation from within the system. 
not through control and manipulation, but through influence. And so the Lord is raising up people that become salt, light, and leaven. I've talked about it before, but we have so many guests. I want to just get us on the same page, and we'll go on to today's, today's study. Salt. When the Lord talked about us being the salt of the earth, the context was that salt adds flavor. Historically, you know that salt is how they, what they used to preserve meat. And so I had taught my entire life that uh, us being the salt of the earth is we are a preservative from things decaying around us. That's true, but it wasn't the point of Jesus. The point Jesus made was when a salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing. The point is salt, the people of God, add flavor, are supposed to make life more enjoyable. Make life more enjoyable, make things work. Not because we have the answer to everything. Now, I don't know that God can trust us by being the, the answer to everything. That's, that, that puts us in a scary place because we become too powerful. But what I, what I believe the Lord does want to do is for you to have the same cry that Solomon had. The Lord appeared to him in his dream and he says, what would you like? You can have anything you want. He said, I want a hearing ear. God says, because you didn't ask for fame, money, uh, long life, I'm gonna give you all of that, plus I'm gonna give you what you asked for, and he said, I will give you wisdom. So God's interpretation of the hearing ear was wisdom. In other words, two sides of the same coin. If you wanna have a life of wisdom, you have to have the capacity to hear from God because that's where wisdom comes from, all right? So what's the point? Is we can get in over our head, not know what's going on, but be confident because we know the one who has the answer. Somebody can say, what do we do in this situation? I don't know, but I'll have an answer in the morning. And then we get home and go, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> but, but the point is, is we know the one with the answer. We know the book with the solutions. So the Lord speaks to Solomon. He says, you can have anything you want. And he chose a hearing ear, which the Lord interpreted as wisdom. Salt, when it loses its flavor, is worthless and this cast out good for nothing. The word worthless there actually means foolish. So it's as though salt is representative of the wisdom of God and its impact on society. It's the wisdom of the Lord through the believer that makes life more enjoyable. It's not the wisdom of God of control, that we want to be in charge of everything. That's, that's, I, I don't like that. I, and, and we've tried that. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not good for us to try to be in charge. It's good for us to be servants of everyone. And to add the quality of life, it's like, it's like you just knowing how to have a good family life, you knowing how to do business well, you knowing how to, to uh, reach out to broken people, etc. The kinds of things that all of us add to the city, we just make life more enjoyable, and that's the assignment. Be salt. How do you do that? You live with great wisdom. You allow the nature of God. See, wisdom unites the spirit of man with the mind of a man. Wisdom is what links the two. The two that seem to work so independent at times, wisdom is what links the two because it is the fulfillment of the cry of the intellect of man and the spirit of the man because it's the mind of Christ. Wisdom is divine reasoning. Salt, light, and leaven. Leaven, excuse me, salt, uh, light. Uh, you are the light of the world, he says in, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew. Light exposes but that wasn't how he used it. That's how I've taught it because that's my discipleship training. <laughs> we preserve, we expose, that's who we are. <laughs> it's, it's, anybody else have that kind of background? Besides, I mean, that's just the way I was. It was, my parents weren't like that, but I was, you know. So it's just, yeah, we're here to let you know how rotten that is. <laughs> it says, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. So the way he used light of the world is that you're in a place of visibility that will attract people that need shelter, that need safety. I believe in the go of the gospel. I believe going to all the world. That's, but that is what we emphasize constantly. There's another aspect that needs to be heralded, championed, and that is people come to the city set on a hill. People come to the spring and drink. People come to the fruit tree and eat. 
There's something about having something that is attractive to those who are in need of answers and breakthrough. And I believe that in this season, as we emphasize this story, um, that the Lord is highlighting the fact that he's giving us permission to be fruitful and then give the fruit away. Be fruitful and then serve people with what God has added to your life. Perhaps one qualifier that might be important is it would be foolish for us to wait until we have every area of our life figured out. (laughs) Jesus will probably have returned by that time. (laughs) The best thing is you got fruit in one area, share the fruit realizing you got work to do on another area. I really do believe it's biblical. When, when uh, Israel was arguing as to who should be in a leadership as head priest, uh, the Lord said he chose Aaron, and that wasn't, that wasn't good enough for all the tribes. So God says, fine, take a dead almond branch, put the name of each tribe. So there's 12 tribes, including uh, the Levitical tribe, and Aaron's name is on that one. And so they put, uh, or, or Levi is put on that one, and they put the 12 tribes in before the presence, excuse me, the 12 dead branches before the presence of the Lord. And they get up in the morning and 11 of the branches are still dead, but one of the branches has sprouts, buds, blossoms, and ripe almonds. And it was Aaron's. Resurrection life is the mark of divine leadership. But please notice, it wasn't all ripe almonds. Resurrection life means there's life. Doesn't mean there's always maturity. All of us better have sprouts and some buds and some, we all better have something that's constantly developing in us. That make sense? All right. One last comment on this and then we'll actually get back to this deal here. Leadership, divine leadership, when it's correct, makes life better for everyone under their influence. The the Bible talks about when the righteous are exalted, a city rejoices. Why? Because they just add flavor. And if that's not the effect, then we have to go back and find out why. Because true leadership is alive to make life better for everybody under their influence. Improper leadership is self-serving, self-promoting. All right. Where we went last week and where uh, I, I, I need to cover a few, for a few minutes today is Solomon in his encounter with God. He's sleeping. The Lord appears to him in his sleep, says you can have anything you want. Solomon says, I'll take the hearing ear, wisdom. But his reasoning, the place that he prayed from, if you can put it this way, you, you, ever, get, you ever worried about something when you go to bed and you dream about it or you have a nightmare about it or whatever when you go to sleep? Picture Solomon going to bed, being concerned for his destiny, for his purpose in life. It's not in the story. It may not be true, but I think it's, it's reasonable to read into it. Solomon was overwhelmed with his assignment. And if you're not overwhelmed by your assignment, you don't see it clearly. Because being overwhelmed is actually the place from which poor in spirit comes from. Poor in spirit is not self-criticism, it is not self-judgment, it is not self-condemning. That is a counterfeit. That gives people the feeling of humility, but it is completely void of courage and faith. Poor in spirit is the opposite. It sees our absolute dependency and need on God, but positions us to take risk and see the invasion of God. Poor in spirit is position for extraordinary breakthrough because poor in spirit is not confidence in my capabilities, but absolute confidence in the promises and purposes of God. So Solomon is sleeping and he says, God, I'll take, I'll take the wisdom, I'll take the hearing ear. But before he gave the request, he made this statement. He says, I'm a child. He said, I, I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. Now he's, he's an adult. But, but in his mind, compared to his responsibility, he was overwhelmed with his assignment. And he said, he said I'm, I'm a child. I don't know how to go out. In other words, I don't, I don't know how to take the, the regal nature of my assignment out of the house. And I don't know how to take what I've discovered out there 
back into the place of service. I, I don't know how to do it. And it was out of that place of recognition of need, being overwhelmed with the assignment, that he prayed the pro- profound prayer. God, I need a hearing ear. His father, David, had something similar going on in his heart. And I think most likely this is where Solomon got it. We see David as extremely self-confident, extremely aggressive, a mighty warrior, a very sensitive person to the presence. He was kind of like the ultimate in, in opposite areas, the sensitivity thing, and yet the, the, the man's man kind of approach to life. And yet this guy who had more responsibility than anyone on the planet in his day, more, uh, more uh, wealth, more, you know, more everything, um, he prays in Psalms 131, verse one, he says, he says, God, he says, I just don't involve myself in great matters. That's, you know, that sounds good on paper, but sometimes you read the Psalms and they're just lyrics to a song. You don't realize where it came from. It came out of a heart of a guy who's overwhelmed by his assignment. I would like to suggest both David and Solomon are modeling poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When you're merciful, you get mercy in return. But when you're poor in spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you're merciful, you get mercy in return. When you're poor in spirit, you get the whole kingdom. The entire realm of the dominion of God is accessible by those who are poor in spirit. It's really why Jesus stood at this one very, very uh, profound moment. And he said, Father, he said, I thank you that you did not reveal these things to the wise and to the learned, but instead you revealed them to babes. There was, there's something about awareness of need that attracts the Lord. Jesus stood before religious leaders, those who were highly trained in scriptures. He stood before them and he made this statement. He said, he said, the, it's the sick that need a physician. The well don't need a physician. Of course, referring to himself as one who has come as an answer. And he's looking, if you picture this, he's looking at the most spiritually diseased group on the planet. So he wasn't saying they didn't need his help. He was saying, because you don't recognize your need, I'm not here for you. don't read into it. I I don't mean that he wouldn't have helped them. I'm just saying the recognition of need is the qualifier. For that reason, you've got, you've got, you've got these, you know, geniuses in religious training that are standing three feet away from the Messiah they've been praying for their entire life and they don't know who he is. And yet you've got a woman caught in adultery thrown at his feet. You've got the man of the Gadarenes that is so demonized, he can't see straight, and he falls before Jesus in worship. You've got a tax collector who's a thief. He's been stealing from his, from his own, the citizens of his own city for his entire life. He climbs a tree to get a better view. He wants to see this Jesus. There's something about people that live with an awareness of need that can see clearly. How many of you have heard of Jonathan Edwards? How many of you have heard of John Charles Wesley? How many of you have heard of Charles Finney? Smith Wigglesworth. Can you, can you give me the names of their critics? In their day, their critic was as powerful as they were. In their day, their critics were as well known as they were. But history diminishes the effect of the critic. John and Carol Arnott are, I think, probably the two most poor in spirit people I've ever met in my life. The Lord honored them with a tremendous outpouring 20 years ago, and it's building again because they have not come to the Lord as experts. They have come to the Lord as children once again. The challenge before us is that childlike heart that even though I have many years now of experience in these things, to realize the need before me is so great that if you don't show up, I am bound to fail. 
I'm thankful, but I am so needy. And it's that combination that they model so well that I, I champion whenever I get a chance to. All right. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, and let's uh, see if we can make the most of our time here. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 4 is where I want you to go. 1 Kings chapter 4. You guys all right? Everybody alive? You can help us to save, help me to save a little bit of time if you'll put a piece of paper in Isaiah 60. We will go there next. First Kings chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart. Read, let's read that again. God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. I love the thought that wisdom satisfies the cry of the spirit of man. Largeness of heart. Thus Solomon, uh, verse 30, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ez Ezraite, Haman the whatever that is, Darda and whoever that is. You know what I like about this verse is God is acknowledging the wisdom of people outside of his own nation. Isn't that amazing? That the Lord actually honored these people that were not of the house of Israel. He honored them by acknowledging they had wisdom. Verse 32, he spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Verse 34 is our key verse in this section. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people. But, his Lord, his, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Hold your place there. I'll come back to it in a moment. <clears throat> in, on a Thursday in May 1979, I had an encounter with the Lord over this passage. It changed my life. It changed me from a person that could only see the tragedy that happens in the last days to a people, to a person that looked at what God was wanting to do in the last days for the redeeming, the saving, the transformation of cities and nations. I'll never, I could take you to the spot on the floor where the Lord spoke to me. I, I have lived since May of 79 for this one thing, to see cities and nations transformed by a people that walk with presence, with a sense of purpose, walk with wisdom and power. Solomon, had such an extraordinary wisdom that people came from all over the earth, including kings. Kings would come to sit at his feet to hear of his wisdom as he spoke of nature, he spoke of creation, he spoke of the mysteries of life. It, it doesn't even give us the record of what he said, it just says he talked about them. It was so profound that they'd sit there and shake their head. The, the common agreement would have been something like, uh, you know, the servants who sit at your feet are better off than the kings who rule outside of, out of this, yeah. this nation, this environment. And so here's Solomon giving these extraordinary explanations for life and problems that would come up. And it's, it's a profound experience to see how Solomon impacted culture and society. I believe he's the pro prophetic prototype, not of an individual, but of a body of believers. And this is, this is the thing that I'm, I'm most moved over. So look at the picture again. 
People come from all over the world to sit at Solomon's feet to hear wisdom. They came to him. They came to the spring. They came to the garden. They came to the fruit tree. They came to the house. They came to the city set on the hill. That was the point. Isaiah 65, excuse me, 60 verse 1. Arise and shine for your light has come. I believe with absolute confidence that that verse is talking about you and me and not a day off into the future. Why? Jesus, John, John chapter 1 says, Jesus is the light that enlightens every person that comes into the world. There isn't another light coming. When he says, arise and shine, your light has come. There isn't another light. There isn't another light. He came. So get up. You don't need another prophetic word. You don't need another confirming song. You don't need another confirming open door. Just get up. Get up and shine. And it says that the resurrected one will arise over you. So you get up, he arises over you. I mean, it's a profound picture. It's like, I'm not going to contain this. I believe in the goodness of God enough to stand up confident that he will demonstrate himself in and through me. So get up. You get up, he says, I arise over you. And then he goes on and he says, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Where have we seen this before? Solomon. That's exactly what happened. Is the, the, the men of the earth, the kings, the leaders, the queen of Sheba, they came from distant parts of the world to sit at the feet because there was a wisdom that drew them. Listen, there is something in the heart of people that craves the mind of Christ. It's why they hung around him. He was not abusive with his knowledge. He didn't use it to make people feel bad. He didn't beat them over the head with his insight versus their ignorance. It was completely different. He was the shade tree they came and would stand under. In the midst of their grotesque sin and all the stuff that was wrong with their life, they would seek shade under his tree. They would seek shelter from his city. It's the picture of the people of God living with wisdom. Isaiah 60, I think, is profoundly relevant for us in this subject. Arise, shine, because your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth, deep darkness the people, but his light will appear upon you. His glory will arise on you. Nations will come. See, when you get a phrase like that, nations coming, when the church is so predisposed to see so few make it, and so many condemned, we have no ears for hearing the promise that shapes the course of history. Yeah. Nations will come to what? Your light. Yeah. And kings, even kings, even those who are highly exalted in their world will come to the brightness of your rising. The story continues. Isaiah 60, 61, 62 are profound chapters on the purposes of God in our lifetime. I want you to look at 61. Isaiah 61 is the passage that Jesus quoted in Luke 4 at his, in his inaugural address, if you will, as he is announcing the beginning of his ministry. He stands up in the synagogue in Nazareth. And it was his turn to read. He's just one of the guys. He didn't stand out to anybody. He stood up to read. And as he read, he read out of Isaiah 61, verse 1. And he said these words. And when he spoke these words, the environment of the room changed. And people sat there absolutely stunned that they just had this moment. A moment that nobody else had ever had in all of history. And he read these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, giving them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. What is he saying here? 
says, the spirit of the Lord came upon me. Why? Because there's a reason. Because there's broken people all over the place. Some don't see. Some are in prison. Some are held captive by this and by that. Some have shattered, shattered minds, shattered hearts from the experiences of life. Some of them are just in such deep mourning. They, they need the mantle of praise. Some of them need consoling. Some of them, their life has been reduced to ashes. I've come to give beauty in the place of ashes. I don't like any, any religious system that does not have value for beauty and excellence. Beauty is valuable to God. It is valuable to God. This whole thing that is carnal, listen, stop it. It's what illustrates his wonder, his own glory. He creates the world, he stands back and he says, wow, it's good. Trust me, I know good and it's good. And he, he, he pronounces goodness of his own creation because he is a God of excellence and a God of beauty. And we have the privilege in everything we do, the way we treat people, the way we talk, the, the, the way we handle different parts of life. We, it, it's not a money issue. It's not if I throw a million dollars into the problem, then it'll look better. It's not that. It's can I approach my life with excellence? Can I, can I bring the best out of me for this situation? Can, can I work towards beauty? These things are valuable to Jesus. And he makes this profound analogy of what the anointing is for. But look at this, verse four. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. Who's they? It's only you if you are mentioned in verses one through three. It's the people of verses one through three. So were you broken? Yep, okay, then you qualify. <laughs> the whole point is, is that Jesus builds with the broken. He doesn't build with those who break things. That's why he couldn't build with David. He had to build with Solomon. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They will raise up former devastations. They will repair ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. I realize everybody in this room, if you've been born again, you've been born again because you were broken and you recognized need and you called on the name of the Lord and he changed your life forever. That's absolutely true. But listen carefully to me. A city is only restored when we value the most broken in the city because they are the building team. I believe in ministering to the wealthy and to the influential and the, mount, mount, the mind molders. I believe in all of that as part of the assignment that we have. But if there's not a value for the derelict, for the, most, for the addict, the one who sells her body so that she has food to feed her children. Without a value for those broken of the most broken, there is no healing of the city because they are the primary builders. And that, folks, is the wisdom of God. Let's read it again, verse four. <laughs> Makes me happy whenever I get to it. They shall rebuild old ruins. They will raise up former desolations. Wow. They will repair ruined cities. The desolations of many generations. How many know, as a nation, I realize we have people from all over the world, but how many of you know from the US, we have desolations in our nation that are the result of many generations undermining the purposes of God. And this is saying, the key to the building is the one that would be the easiest for you to reject. The easiest one to ignore is the key to the building. Verse five, strangers will stand and feed your flocks. Sons of a foreigner should be your plowman, your vine dresser. You'll be named priest of the Lord. They will call you servants 
of our God. You'll eat the riches of Gentiles in their glory. You will boast. Go back to the first phrase of verse 6. You shall be named or called priests of the Lord. Another reason, I don't know if this is needful for you, but it's important for me to say. Another reason, I believe this passage is prophetically dealing with the people of God in this hour is because of that phrase. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You see, in Exodus 19, verse 6, this idea of the priesthood of every believer was introduced. God introduced it, gave it to Moses. Picture now, we've got 12 tribes in Israel, and God is telling Moses, all of my people are going to be priests, not just the one religious tribe, the tribe of Levi. All of them are going to be priests. What does it mean to be a priest? It doesn't mean to wear a backward collar. It doesn't mean that you have an office in a cathedral somewhere. It means that you are one who ministers to God, you minister to believers, and you minister to pre-believers. Yeah. <laughs> to God and to, and to people. We represent, in an, in to, to reverse the, the, uh, the definition would be this is that not only do you minister to God and minister to people, but you actually represent people before God and you represent God before people. There is that role as well. That's what Jesus did when he said what the Father was saying. He was representing the Father to humanity. And when he prayed, he says, Father, and he, in John 17, he begins to pray about what he had done. He was representing humanity, saying, God, I gave them my glory that they, they might be one. He, he was representing humanity before the Father. So in Exodus 19, he introduces the concept, and he points forward, and he says, you shall be priests of the Lord. In Isaiah, you shall be priests of the Lord. What is that? Moses, the law, Isaiah, the prophets, pointing to the future. There's a day coming when you shall be priests of the Lord. First Peter 2, verse 9, he stands and he says, you are. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are. You shall be, said the law. You shall be, said the prophets. You are, said the apostle Peter. Because it's now. This passage, I, I'm not ready to deal with this very well. So I'm going to open up a can of worms and I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> Which is actually a great pleasure for me. I've, I've never minded confusing people. <laughs> There is a transfer of wealth and resources coming to the people of God. But it's for the purpose of being empowered to serve effectively. I believe there's a benevolence movement that is not only going to attend to the needs of the poor, but will break the cycle of poverty. Amen. The Lord is, is giving us wisdom. I've been crying out for this for a number of years, giving us wisdom to know how to break the cycle of poverty. poverty. How I many of you know throwing money at a problem doesn't always fix the problem? So it's not the answer, and yet you still have to have the resources. We have passages like this of the resources of the Gentiles. What is he saying? I believe he's just saying, listen, I'm going to put the wealth of the nations at your disposal. Why? Because you've discovered who you are. You are there as a formerly broken person that is to see other broken people healed unto the rebuilding of cities. And to do it, we'll need resources to do it right. The challenge that is before us right now is that the world around us um, are, are looking for three things. It's how well we steward resources, favor, and authority. Resources, favor, and authority. How well do we steward what's been put in our hands? I, I believe there's a message, if you will, just through the actions of benevolence. There's a message, if you will, just through the care that we give. You guys are known for, uh, for your, your generosity and your kindness to broken and poor people. I remember when my brother moved here um, 
uh, from the Bay Area. He moved up, up here, uh, runs a ministry, great ministry all over the world, but he moved up here just to be a help to me. And he moved here, and as soon as he got here, went down to the grocery store to buy some food, and there was somebody outside that was in need, so he stopped to help them, and the person said, no, nah, somebody's already inside getting me food. And he goes in to find out somebody from here was already in there shopping to buy this person food. He says, I can't even give food away, you know. It's really frustrating, because somebody already got there first. The, the point is, you're You're known for that, but let's go bigger. Let's think bigger. Let's think bigger as the Lord entrusts more and more of the resources of the world system around us into our charge. What are we going to do with it? How can we we initiate a benevolence movement? I believe there's a movement started. Let me just throw it out. With Norway, I believe there's a benevolence movement with the resources of Norway, with the state of California, and with Hong Kong. I believe those are three key places where a benevolence movement movement will start, that will impact the course of history, and in many cases, break the cycle of poverty, even over entire nations. It's important because wisdom is seen. Wisdom is seen by our stewardship of what God puts in our charge. It, it's, it's, like, it's like we become obsessed or possessed with this vision of what could happen in our lifetime, and then all of a sudden, God's put, God puts resources, a favor, of open doors, of money, whatever it might be. He puts that into your charge, and you're already ready to invest it because you, you know what God has put in your heart to do. This is... You have to stay away from the lottery mentality that says when the big day comes, it has to be already practiced with what's in my pocket. I'll tell you what, it starts before you have the money. Do I have hope to make a difference? Do I have hope? Is it possible? I don't, uh, we, we know the individual can be saved. We know the family. I'm thinking cities and nations now. One of the things that we're being challenged in is how well will we handle resources? How well will we handle favor? How well will we handle authority? Authority is used to manifest and demonstrate righteousness and to demonstrate justice. I'll end with this. The Bible says that there is wealth hidden in the soil of the poor. But injustice keeps it from them. What does that mean? That means in this, man, I I haven't dealt with this ever before except in this session like this, but this benevolence movement is connected to our ability to demonstrate the justice of God, not aimed at people, but aimed at the powers of darkness that have been feeding lies to the church for decades. Lies that says you're gonna be rescued and that's your only hope. Instead of having a confidence, an inborn confidence in the power and the beauty and the wonder of the gospel. It says, there's wealth in the soil of the poor and justice keeps it from them. So picture this. It's like resources that break them out of poverty are this far away, but injustice stands in between. So how well do we use authority? It means we stand on their behalf and intercede and pray for the breaking of that spirit of injustice. And finally, people don't want to be fed stuff all their lives. They want to work and be rewarded for their labor. It's in the desire of people's, it's, it's in their hearts. And, and it's, it's being able to speak to that and give opportunity to give rise to that. It's the people of God that have a plan, that have a vision. And I believe living intentionally with wisdom to bring, I've gone past my time, I'm sorry. We just, we just, gotta, we just gotta end this thing. But why don't you stand and I'll end while you're standing. That, that, then I have to end. See, then I, have to, I, I can't keep going. So good. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than Bethel and buildings and... Yes. All the stuff that we do, I believe in it. I believe in it, believe me, probably more than anybody in this room, but it's not about any of that. It's about let's just have the tools that we need to plant the people into the system to be a blessing. To be a blessing. To add flavor. To make life better. Any leader that's worth their place is to make life better for everybody around them. 
I want to read this passage to you. I've read it already in this series, but I will end with this. I most likely promise. (laughs) It's as close to a promise as I can get without making a vow. (laughs) I've read it to you before. It's that passage in Proverbs that says, by wisdom a house is built. In the Bible, house very seldom, especially in Proverbs and prophetic passages, very seldom was it actually referring to a building. House of David was his lineage. It's his family line. House of Israel was the nation. It was the culture that they lived in. So think this, this translation is good at extracting that, all right? Wise people are builders. They build families, businesses, communities, and through intelligence and insight, their enterprises are established and endure. Because of their skilled leadership, the hearts of people are filled with the treasures of wisdom and the pleasures of spiritual wealth. Man, this makes me happy. Put your hand on your heart. Let's pray. Father, we just, we do embrace this call, this, this identity shift of being a people that add flavor, people that provide safety and safe place. And Lord, I do ask that you would give us such insight on just how we maneuver, how we navigate in this particular privilege and assignment in life. And that everybody in this room, everyone who listens on podcast and Bethel TV, there'd be this shift in hearts that says, God, we want to steward what you give us well, from the resources to the favor to the authority. I pray it so that injustice would be broken and that cities and nations would be presented to you as those who love you well. We pray this for the honor of the name Jesus.